to the Polgar Chess University. In this week's lesson, I'd like to tell you about the most important rook and pawn versus rook and games. I have to say that statistics shows that 50% of all end games are rook end games in practice. Here is our first example. White has a far advanced passed pawn already on the sixth rank, just two squares away from the promotion square. The challenge is that in the meantime, the white rook is occupying that promotion square. So, for example, after black goes behind the pawn to a1 and white advances the pawn, it seems that it's not so easy for the rook to get out of the corner without losing that a7 pawn. In reality, thanks to some tactical motives, white is winning in this position. For example, if the black king walks towards the white pawn, then white can use the motif of skewer and play rook h8, threatening to advance the pawn, and when the rook captures the pawn, then make a skewer and win the rook. On the other hand, if black moves away from the seventh rank and moves, for example, to d6, then the rook can give a check and simply then promote the pawn to a queen. White, of course, doesn't need to worry about some checks from the side either because typically for similar rook endgames, the king can simply go in a zigzag and get closer to the rook until the other side runs out of checks. Let's move on to our next example, in which the only difference is that the black king is on g7 and not in the middle file on e7. It is a big difference, as the outcome of this endgame is a draw. Regardless who's to move, whether black or white, black can save this game playing accurately. The main thing that black needs to remember is that the king needs to remain on either the g7 or h7 squares. Moving the king to f7 would be a blunder because then the rook would get to come to h8 just like in the previous example, and then win the rook by a skewer. So in this position, all black needs to do is make waiting moves. It could be moving the king back and forth between h7 and g7, or it could be moving the rook, for example, to a3. The advantage of moving the rook to a3 is that in the meantime it keeps the white king below the third rank. The only hope white would have in such positions to win is to bring their king to b6, protect the pawn on a7, and then intend to move the rook out of the corner without losing that pawn on a7. So let's see, for example, the king moves to f2 and black makes waiting moves and the white king is getting closer and black keeps waiting and they both keep continuing with this plan until the white king reaches the b file attacking black's rook. Now it's crucial that the black rook remains on the A file behind white's pawn. Naturally, if the rook would move away somewhere, the white rook would be free to move and then to promote the pawn. Generally, it's a good idea to keep the rook 
as far away as possible from the opponent's king. King b3 and now white is intending to move up to b6 with the king. Here black has a choice to keep waiting by moving the king to h7 or moving the rook somewhere along the a file. Either one works. Black keeps waiting and black can keep waiting until the moment when the white king reaches a square b6 or b7 or a6 in some cases to where it protects the pawn on a7. When that happens it means that white is threatening to move his rook and that's a sign that we need to start giving checks not giving white the time to do that. Now the king needs to get out of check. Black can choose to give a couple more checks or simply move right back behind the pawn. And again tying down the white rook to the a8 square to protect that pawn. Again as soon as the king comes next to the pawn protecting it we give a check. As soon as the king is away from the pawn, we're free to go back to put pressure on that pawn. White cannot make progress in this position. Let's move on to a different type of position. In this position, white's challenge is that the king is in front of the pawn, not the rook this time. Also, it's important that the black rook is on the B file, not letting the king out of the corner. The only way the white king could get out of there if he'd succeed to chase away the black rook from its current position or being somewhere, anywhere uh, along the B file. The only way white could accomplish that theoretically by moving his rook to b8 or maybe b7. Let's see if that can work. For example, white plays rook h2, black plays king c7. Important! Now, not only the black rook stops the king from escaping from the corner, but so does the black king. For example, rook comes, give a check, of course, we stay on c8, not letting the white king out. After a second check, again the king goes to c7. And after rook b8, true, the rook needs to leave the b file, but it's enough that the king is on c7, not letting the white king out of the corner. And having the rook on the c file, we're making sure that the white rook will not get a chance to chase the black king away from the c file. Therefore, in this position, white cannot make progress. This is a draw. On the other hand, this position is winnable for white. The reason for that is that the black king is too far away from the c7 square which we saw was crucial in the previous example. Here is the winning road for white. The rook, just like in the previous position, needs to get quickly to the b-file to rescue the king from the corner. The black king is running, trying to get to the c-file. This is a tricky moment because the obvious looking check and then rook b7 fails to win because after rook c2 white cannot escape from the corner because of the unexpected checkmate. Therefore the only correct move here is rook to c8 not c7 and after king d6 or king d7 which We'll look at first, then rook b8. Now the rook is forced to leave the b-file and let the white king finally get out of the corner and clear the road 
for the white apron. But now the question is, how can the white king hide from all the checks? Without losing the apron. For example, if the king would go to a5, then black would check again, forcing the king back to b6. Luckily for white, the king can escape through c5, and the rook on b8 is protected, of course. After a couple more checks, black will have no checks left, and white is simply winning. Let's see, on the other hand, what happens if in this position black continues with king d6 with the idea to prevent the white king from escaping on c5 as in the previous variation. Rook b8, rook a2, king b7, rook b2. Now, if the king goes to a6, then white does not make any progress because, as I said, the c5 square is guarded by black's king. And after king a5, white would be busy guarding the a7 pawn and keep going back to b6. Let's go back to this position. And here, the correct move is moving to c8. Now black is in trouble. Nevertheless, they can still make white's life difficult. Check. King d8. It seems that black is out of checks, and next move, white is ready to promote the pawn. But here is the tricky move. Rook h2, threatening checkmate in the corner on h8. Now, white must delay promoting the pawn. The best move is giving a check on b6, and after king c5, not promoting the pawn, which would be lost right away after a skewer in the corner. This is an important idea to remember, but playing rook c6. A very nice move, with the idea that if king takes rook, the pawn promotes with a check, reaching an easily won endgame. Black's best defense is to play king b5, as now white still cannot promote the pawn because of the skewer on the 8th rank. And the winning move now is rook to c8. And now black can only delay the end with two more checks, after which the pawn is unstoppable. A very important instructive Endgame. Now I would like to show you two of the most famous classic rook and pawn versus rook endgames. The first one is the famous Lucina position, where white faces a similar challenge as in the previous position, the king being in front of the pawn, and that being the reason why the pawn cannot promote so easily. The big difference is that here white has a middle pawn and not a rook pawn. When white had a rook pawn, it creates special difficulties because of the limitation of the chessboard and the king cannot go to one side only to the other because of the edge of the board. Here, potentially, the king can escape on either side, on the e-file or the c-file. At the moment, though, the black rook is preventing the king's escape on the e7 or e8 squares, and the black king prevents it on the c7 or c8 squares. Even though white can accomplish the chasing away of the black king easily, and then rescuing of the king, it doesn't quite solve the problem so easily because a lot of checks would come from the back. And if the king goes away from the pawn, then the rook would move back behind the pawn and win it. 
And the only other way the king could hide is moving right back to where it came from on d8. Therefore, white needs to prepare this escape better. There are numerous methods to win here for white, but my clearly favorite one is the famous bridge building method. What that means is that white prepares the escape so when those checks come from the back the white rook can interpose on the fourth rank. So therefore the first move should be rook to c4 black for example makes a waiting move then we check chasing the black king away and then the king is ready for the escape. Now the pawn is about to promote, so black has to give the checks. And another check. And if check, and check, finally, white is ready to block the check, interpose, and the white pawn is unstoppable. If, on the other hand, black did not give these last two checks, but makes a waiting move, considering that in the meantime, white cannot promote the pawn, then white would bring the rook to the fifth rank with the idea to interpose on the fifth rank on d5. You may wonder, why didn't white bring the rook to the fifth rank right away? The challenge with that is that after, for example, the check on b5, the black king is too close to the white rook and gets to attack it. So that's the reason why the ideal square or rank rather for the white rook is the fourth rank and not any other. And now let's switch to a different type of position, the so-called famous Philidor position. Here, black is doing much better than in the previous positions because the king is right on the promotion square of white's pawn. Here, black can draw without much difficulty, just knowing one important rule. The black rook should stay on the sixth rank on any safe square until the moment that white will push the e-pawn, which is the only way white can try to make progress, to advance that pawn, and then try to advance the king, and then try to checkmate on the eighth rank. Whenever that happens, that the white pawn advances, that's the moment that the rook needs to come back to the first rank or second rank, and to make sure the rook is ready to give the checks from the back and give the checks and basically white cannot really hide if the king goes far away from the pawn then we can always of course attack the pawn as well or just keep giving checks the position is a draw let's see now a more complex position such as this one. Here the big difference between the previous positions that we've seen is that the white pawn is not that far advanced yet as it was in all our previous examples. The good news on the other hand is that the black king is not under the white pawn and has trouble reaching the promotion square because the white rook is cutting it off. It's important to know about such and similar positions that if the white pawn would reach the fifth rank, for example after playing king b4, white would succeed to play c5 while keeping the black king cut off, the win would be rather simple. 
Therefore, after king b4, black's best choice is to give a check. And if, for example, the king would go to c5, keep giving checks. And white's challenge is that the pawn would be unprotected on c4 and the king would need to keep going back to protect it. However, white can do better. Namely, going to a5. Now again, white is threatening to advance the pawn, so black either must give a check or attack the pawn. The king would go back to b5, and after the next check, the king should go to a6. Now, if another check would come, then king b7, and black ran out of checks, and next the pawn will be ready to advance. Therefore, the best defense for black in this position is to play rook c8. And now, the only way to make progress is to move the rook behind the pawn so the pawn is protected and is ready to advance. Of course, the drawback of this move is that it lets the black king get closer to the action. King b7 attacks the rook and again attacks the rook with a tempo, better than advancing the pawn right away. And now, pawn is ready to advance, even though the black king temporarily reaches the key promotion square, it's unable to stay there long enough. Rook g1, now white is threatening to check and chase the king out. For example, after rook h6, white would just block the check, and when the rook retreats, white would play rook a1, threatening checkmate in the corner. When black cannot avoid losing his rook after, for example, king b8, c7, and the skewer in the corner. Well, I hope you learned a lot from these very instructive and important rook and pawn endgames. Finally, I'd like to show you a duel that was played by former world champion Alexander Alekhine in a simultaneous game. It's also a rook and game, but with multiple pawns. In this position, as we can see, black is up a pawn. Nevertheless, it's white who is winning. It seems that after white advances the pawn, to a6, after rook h4, a7, rook h8, black arrives right on time and is ahead. However, here is a beautiful idea for you to remember. White is able to play rook d8, preventing the black rook from coming to h8. Hey, but this is giving up a rook. Very true, but then a7 and the pawn is unstoppable. What a beautiful end. Well, thank you for listening and hope you'll be back next week. So long until then.